We're going to be working our way back into Samuel, where we left off last week. Let's go before the Lord. Father, we must come before you and implore the giving of your gracious spirit to us this morning. Lord, we ask you to help us understand and comprehend this, this great word and see what it has in it for us. There's something here for each of us to take home this day. There's something here that will make us better disciples. There's something here that will sharpen us. And Lord, we thank you. We are a blessed people, Lord God. We are blessed because we don't have to worry about people telling us we can't have our Bibles or read our Bibles, Lord God. And we pray, Lord, as you send revival into this nation, that people will open the word, that people will come to know you, that there will be a personal relationship, Lord God. And we thank you that you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. As we read about you in the story of David, we, we read about who you are. And we thank you for that, Lord, that you never change. We know who you are. We know what you can do. And we stand in awe of you forever. And we just ask your help this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. All right. We know that David, of course, is being chased by Saul. Saul is jealous of him. Saul wants him dead. Saul will. If Saul can't kill him, he'll kill the members of his family. He will do whatever it takes to get rid of David. And uh, David asks if the... Uh, we're going to start... We're going we're gonna to break into this at 1 Samuel 23, 10, 11, and 12. That may overlap a little bit, but we'll start there. Well, let me just say... Uh, the city of Keilah in Israel had come under attack by the by the uh, by the Pharisees by by the Philistines, and uh, someone had come to David and told him about the attack that they were taking the they were robbing the uh, the, the winnowing f uh, floors from uh, Israel, and uh, David went and he attacked them and he had a great victory and he. Uh, he was able to go down to Keilah and to uh, bring a victory there for them. And uh, Samuel knew that he was now in a confined city that had walls and had gates. So he realized that this is his, re his real chance to go down and capture David because he knows where he's at and he's not in the wide open spaces where he could just run away. He was confined and this was going to be a, a, a very easy way for Saul to have his vengeance against David. So we'll start there at 1 Samuel 23, 10 through 12. Then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men Keilah deliver me will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. Then David said, Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hands of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver you. So we're setting the stage here that uh, is going to follow David is the fact that when he had gone to the priest at the tabernacle at Nob, and the priest had given him bread and told him to take uh, Goliath's sword, that this has been, uh, that since then uh, David is running. And uh, he knows that Saul is coming to Keilah. And you would think it would be shameful for the people to turn on him like they are doing. But they must remember, got to remember that when, when, uh, when, uh, having a blank here. <clears throat> that when the people, when the people had called for David to help, he went down there to help. And they have to remember what uh, Saul had done at, at Nob through his servant Doeg, when we called a dog through Doeg. He had killed 85 priests, hacked them to death with his sword, and then he went after their families in the, in the city of, of Nob, where he wiped out every, hum, every living human being, every woman, every infant, every child, every animal was, was killed by the edge of the sword. So you really can't blame the people of Keilah if they would hand David over because if he don't, God may very well destroy his entire family, uh, the entire town. And so David is going to run away here again. 
But one thing we see here is that David has stopped his foolishness and he's relying on, on God before he makes any moves now. He wants to know what God has to say, as all of us should. I can't tell you how many mistakes I made in my life because I tried to do it on my own wisdom. I tried to figure it out myself, how much I believed that maybe God didn't really care about my little personal problems and this great big world of his with all the things he's got going on that I, don't even, I, I wasn't even on God's radar screen. But, of course, that's not the truth. God cares about each and every one of us individually and loves us. And so David and his men, about 600, arose and departed from Keilah and went there for, and went wherever they could go. They just scattered. They, there's no set place. Again, they're just trying to get away. Then, it was, then it, was, it was told to Saul that David had escaped from Keilah, so he halted the expedition so he don't have to worry about them being in trouble or anything. Once he found out that David wasn't there, which was his whole reason for going, that it wasn't worth him going anymore. It says in 1 Samuel 23:14. It says that, uh, and David stayed in strongholds in the wilderness, in the wilderness of Zip. Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. That's a, that's a word for all of us. That's a word of encouragement for all of us, because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God is, has no favoritism with people. What he does for one, he will do for another. And it says again, David stayed in the strongholds in the wilderness of Zip. Saul sought him every day. We have an enemy that searches after us every single day. You know, I, we can never lose sight of that fact. We never want to just think that, well, we're going to get up on the morning and have our, our regular day, and we've got a plan of things to do. Every day we wake up, every moment that we are alive, every moment that we're on this side of heaven, we should realize that we have a devil that comes after us every single day. He does not rest, as God neither slumbers or sleep, neither does him, neither does he. You know, and I heard somebody say something the other day I hadn't thought about. You know, we raise a new generation of Christians every so many years. They'll be the next generation and the next generation. But there are no more evil angels than what already are, and they have been through a thousand battles. And one of the things they talk about in warfare is one of the advantages a general may have is if his people have been battle tried, you know, gone through the blood of battle and, the heck, and, the, and the, all the things of battle. But we always send out a new generation that has to trust in the strength of the Lord, which is more than what Satan has. But we go up against one who is in a, you know, it's not just that there's evil in the world. I'll, I'll hear people say that they won't recognize a personal uh, enemy like the devil, but they will say that evil is in the world. But the evil that we fight is an intelligent evil. It thinks, it's plans. It's not just some thing out there. It's not just some darkness that we walk into a room and light it up. But it is indeed an intelligent evil. Satan, Satan knows your father and mother. Satan knows your grandparents. Satan knows your great-grandparents. See, Satan can trace you all the way back to Adam. He knows you. He knows. He, why do you think he's so good at knowing individually how to attack us? You know, sometimes we, are under, we come under a mass attack, but we all know that Satan sits on our shoulder and says things that push our buttons because he knows our buttons to push. He knows what to do. He is an intelligent evil. But the, the good word that is here is that as he attacked David every day, so God defended him every day. We thank God that God doesn't just come when he feels like it or God comes when he has time. God is always with us. As the Satan is always attacking us, God is always with us. And notice it says he will, he will not turn us over into his hand. Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. Same goes for you and I. That Satan will seek every day to get us off track. He will cause anything he can cause us to do to fall off what I call the righteous wagon. You know, people fall off the wagon, we fall off the righteous wagon, and we have to work our way back up uh, and just confess our sins and, and get back on there. But every day he attacks us, and every day God delivers us. That takes us to the 15th verse that says, So David saw, so David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Zip in a forest. Saul saw, uh, once again, David is in the school of the wilderness in this forest. We go to our next page, which is our next verse, which is 1 Samuel 23, 16. It says, Then Jonathan, Saul's son, his firstborn, his heir to his kingdom, Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand in God. Again, this is an odd relationship. Again, something that I learned in the study that I hadn't thought about before is the fact that 
Jonathan is probably almost 30 years older than David. This is not a usual type of friendship that you would think about. Uh, when I was growing up, I had a lot of older people that were friends, but you didn't think of them as your, your best buddy. They, you, know, you weren't, you weren't going to go out on a Friday night with them, this kind of thing. But here we have Jonathan, Saul's son, comes out and encourages David. He says, Then Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David and strengthened his hand in God. Uh, he strengthened his hand in God. And I wrote down here, Thank God for the people who strengthen us in Him. Speaking for the Lord. Well, I'll, I'll catch that one in a moment. But I just want to say that again. This world is so negative. So negative. How wonderful it is when people... Don't you enjoy being encouraged? And there's so little of it out there? We live in a very negative world or a very selfish world. People are concerned about themselves and not concerned about others. But we find out... We find out that... Uh, that uh, God will send people into our lives to strengthen our hands. Um, Isaiah, Isaiah, I didn't put this on the board, but Isaiah 35, 3 says, Strengthen the weak hands. This is the prophet Isaiah speaking on God's behalf. So this is the word of the Lord, not the word of Isaiah. The word of the Lord is, Strengthen the weak hands. Make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, Be strong and do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. I want to read that again. Strengthen. This is, this is our responsibility. Strengthen the weak hands. Make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong and do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, He will come and save you. When we gathered around Cheryl last Sunday praying for Seth, that's exactly what we were saying was, do not fear. It's all right. And we need to hear that at times. Even though we know it, we need to hear it. We need to have people build upon that. And we are also responsible for that. Always remember how mad God was at those spies that came back from the promised land. Those ten, not counting Joshua and Caleb. But those others came back with that report that scared the people. Remember, God said, I've given you the land. I've already, I've already promised it to you. That's why it's called the promised land. It was promised to them. And they go in there and the, 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 you know, the, 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 the fruits and the vegetables and everything else are just huge. Everything is big. Everything is plush. There's homes and there's everything there. And there's, but there's giants in the land. And remember that the, these ten said, well, we can't take the land because the giants are there. And yet God had already given them the land. And God was extremely mad about it. He was especially mad at those ten because instead of building faith instead of encouraging like Joshua and Caleb did they went the other route and told all the people that were going to be killed were going to die be careful what you tell a fellow Christian God is indeed listening what he wants us to do is to encourage each other and that's another thing you know David said he'd made up a vow to God that when he was scared he'd run to God but you know what it can also work that when you're scared you can run to your family at the church this is why I feel sorry for those who only look through TV. If you're housebound, that's one thing. But if you can go to church, go to church. Most miracles happen in the midst of community. Let me say that again. Most miracles happen in the midst of community, not one-on-one. -on -one. It's when we gather together where one will put a thousand to flight, two will put ten thousand to flight. Jesus said, wherever there is one or two gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And so God expects us to bring, and I'm just saying this, you know, if, if, you have been, if you're finding yourself drifting into a negative personality, if you're letting the events of life get to you, if you're being choked out by the thorns, the cares of this life, all of us are busy, all of us have issues, all of us have problems, but we don't let that choke out the life of God in us. And in the midst of our problems, it's even a greater, a greater witness if we say to people in the midst of their, of their trials, that it's okay, that God understands that you'll be okay. You're going to make it. We had a, uh, a young man give his testimony at the prison last Sunday. It was a share night. The last Sunday of the month is a share night. And uh, this man had played in worship for quite a while. Uh, his name was Jerome. I don't think you guys knew him. I don't think he was there when you were there. But anyway, he was uh, giving a little bit of his testimony. And I'm just sitting back there listening, and I, I haven't had... 10 minutes worth of speaking to this man. We don't have a real close relationship. It's always, hi, how are you? We shake hands, and he comes in. He kind of has his friends that he, he gathers to. 
and uh, all that's fine. And he was giving his, 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 uh, his testimony. And uh, one of the things he said, and I didn't know he was going to say it, caught me way off guard. Just, he said, and I've had the privilege in being here to watch Skip go through the health problems that he's had between the cancer and the Parkinson's. And he said, we see how he's handling it. Uh, not that I always handle it perfect, but you do realize people are watching and you want to build people up. I want to tell anybody, you know, sometimes I've even looked to see if there's a support group in Bowling Green for people who have Parkinson's and I can't find one. We all know people in this community that do have it. We know that. But there's really no getting together. But I just, and that's not, if that's not in the Lord's plan, that's not in the Lord's plan. But he knows my heart that I'd like to go encourage somebody. I'd like to say, move the best you can. Every time you move, every time you take a step, every time you exercise a muscle, you're helping yourself. Think about the positive things. And know one thing, if you're in Christ Jesus, you're going to be healed on this side or the other, but you will be healed. Amen. Amen. Somebody say amen. 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 So David had the blessing of God that his friend, Jonathan, who is the one who should not have been his friend, David was going to take his kingdom that would have come to him after the death of his father. Uh, we had said before that when David was wondering whether Saul was mad at him or not, and we went through that thing of, of, of Jonathan shooting the arrows and stuff, that that was the last time that they would see each other. Well, I was wrong. Th th this is the last time they will really see each other. David is hiding in the forest. Somehow Jonathan knew where to find him, and he strengthens his hand in the Lord. Uh, sp again, speaking for the Lord, we went through that. I want to give you a quote here. That's the one we just did. This I heard years ago. I wrote it in my Bible, and I've never forgot it. I love this, this definition. A friend is someone who knows the song in your heart and can sing it back to you when you have forgotten the words. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Someone who's so close to you that knows your life song. And we all have a life song. God gives us each a life song. We've got our life to talk about. We've got our life to witness. They're not always pretty. Nobody has lived a, a perfect life by any means. All of us have, have had dark things in our life, but we've seen God come through and turn our lives around in, in His miraculous grace and mercy. And a friend is someone who knows you so well that he knows the song in your heart. And, you know, and, and there are those times when you just want to give up. There's those times that you just want to uh, throw in the towel. And uh, I found myself saying at the prison a couple weeks ago because of some issues that were going on that were past now. But at that time, for the first time ever, I said to somebody, I feel like throwing in the towel. I feel like sometimes it's just not worth it. You know, it's not always easy working with people. I think everybody knows that. You know, it's uh, it just it just uh, we have to bear with one another and love one another. Of course, I didn't mean that. But every, all of us. All of us at times just need to be encouraged. And if you have that gift, and there's people that have that gift, haven't you known people that doesn't matter what, you're not seeking them out for that reason, but anytime you're with them and you walk away, you feel better than before you came? There are people that just do that. And we should always be ready to give encouragement, and we should always be ready to receive encouragement. It's not weakness on your part to say that you need to be encouraged. It's life. The struggles are here. We won't have to encourage each other in heaven, but we certainly need encouragement here. And so when somebody's going through a rough time, don't lie to them, but just tell them the truth. Tell them, you know, you, we as Christians know God's word. Maybe they grew up in a church like I did where you were never taught to pray God's word. You prayed that prayer that was in the back of the hymnal, and you just recited that prayer because you really didn't have a personal relationship. You had a corporate relationship. But we have personal relationships with God, and we can draw on that personal relationship and give that encouragement to others. So I think that's something we all ought to just kind of look in our life. That's, if anything else, as you drive home today, think about what you're doing in people's lives. Who can you encourage? Who can you help? And who also can help you? It's not wrong. You know, I, I love it if somebody comes up to me and says, hey, I want to tell you i got a problem and I want you to pray with me. Or just, hey, tell me what you think about this. And you can encourage them. If they're going the wrong way, put them on the right track. If they're going the right way, encourage them that God hears and God knows and God loves and God is all-powerful and God can do all things. Amen. 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 That's what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. So again, 
A friend is someone who knows the song in your heart and sings it back to you when you have forgotten the words, when you need it, when you've lost the vision, when you've lost the hope, when you need to hear. And then I put the other teaching here, which is next, which you've already said. The gift of encouragement is something we should always be ready to both give and to receive. You see people that think that the gifts of the Spirit are in the ministry itself in the sense of apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. Those are not gifts of the Spirit. Those are gifts of Christ. There is a difference. But in the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives, one of His most precious gifts is, again, this gift of encouragement. If you have a gift of encouragement, I will tell you, I'm I'm probably jealous of you. I believe God has given me the gift to teach, and it's not just a matter of being up here speaking words. What verifies my ministry is you, as all, all ministries are verified by the flock of Jesus Christ. He said, they will not follow a stranger. Amen? And so when people say, I don't care if, you know, it's funny when, when, when a church needs a pastor, and they, you know, I, I knew a guy that was a, a big, rich church in Clayton, and I, I worked with a guy who was a salesman, and uh, we got to talking about the things of the Lord. It was a Presbyterian church, a huge church, full of lawyers and doctors and everything else. And they wanted to, uh, their di- maybe you remember that some years ago, the, 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 their pastor committed suicide, sent his wife and children on a trip to Florida to be with the family, and he took his life after they were gone. And uh, nobody's ever been able to explain why, of course, in, in a case like that. Uh, but the point is, uh, is, is that we need to give encouragement. And they, when they had to go replace that pastor, they were looking for everybody with so many, you know, master's degrees and doctor, doctorates of this and that because there was a reputation of the church to keep. Bless God, you're looking for a pastor. Find someone who's anointed in the Word and find out somebody who will give you courage. Amen? Said of all of us, for all Christians. You know, I don't care how deep that man can get into the Word. If he can't inspire, if he can't tell us, you know, the Word of God and make it applicable in our lives. Like I said, I would be jealous of that person. I know there's people in here that have the Word of encouragement. Whether you realize, you know, I'm not going to call off names here because I'll miss somebody for sure. But it's here. And that that doesn't mean if you don't have the gift of encouragement, you don't have other gifts. You do have other gifts. There's organizational. I'm not going to get into a speech about the gifts of spirit. I really, that's really not my point. But my, my only point is this. It's very important to God that we build people up in the most holy faith. And you know what the great thing about that is? God never fails. God never fails. You tell somebody, you, you know... Have you ever gone up to buy somebody that you thought was having a problem or you knew was having a problem and you said to them, can I pray for you? And have they ever said, no, you can't? Has anybody ever told you, no, you can't pray for them? They're not going to. Don't be afraid. You know, they may think, well, here? <laughs> you know, I love, I love to tell the story of Kenneth Copeland from years ago in his ministry. I've told it to you before, but I, I just love to tell it. It's, an, it's a neat little story. Before the days when you could walk down the concourse at an airport, you know, when you're dropping people off, you could walk them right up to their gate, you know, before you said goodbye. And uh, Copeland was going to a ministerial thing someplace, and he was bringing a friend with him, and his friend was not a saved man. If he was a saved man, he knew very little about the Lord. He might have been a religious man, but he didn't know a lot about God at all. And so they were going to fly together to this place. While they were waiting in the airport, a friend of Copeland's came, didn't realize that they were, you know, at the same gateway or whatever. And uh, Copeland said he was just a big bear of a man. He said, just huge, about 6'4", 6'5", probably weighed in better than 300 pounds. He was just a big man. And as these, as Copeland and his friend were about to get on the plane, this bear of a man says, let me pray over you boys. I'm going to pray over you. So, of course, the guy's a little bit thinks this is a little weird and nobody's ever done that in his life. You pray in church, you don't pray outside of church. We all know that, right? So he's taken aback that this man wants to pray for him. And worse than that, Copeland said he got him in a head a headlock and he got the other guy in a headlock. And he's just, pray, he's just praying out loud. People are walking for it. He's holding them by the head. He's going, God bless these boys. Get them there safely. Use them for your glory. Bless them. Bless their families. Blah, blah, blah. And he says, Amen. Well, it was time for them to board the plane. And Copeland's wondering, I wonder what my friend thinks. 
and they finally got to their seats. They were sitting together. And finally, you know, Copeland keeps waiting. And finally, the guy <laughs> reaches over and he says, by God, we was prayed for. <laughs> and Copeland used it to teach, indeed, by God, the Spirit of God, you were prayed for. And that is something we need to remember. Nobody's going to tell you no. That is one of the biggest entrances of bringing Christ into somebody's life that we fail to use. Nobody is going to tell you not to pray. Now, if you're ashamed to pray, you've got a problem. But if, like Paul, you're not ashamed of the gospel of God, for it is the power of God unto salvation who all who hear. Fantastic. So we, we need to do more of that. And I've gotten much better at it too because, again, it, you guys know me away from church. I'm really not a very loud person or, you know, I'm, I'm kind of an inward drawn person. Uh, God uses me the way he uses me. But uh, to be able to encourage people, to, pray, to be able to pray for people, uh, you reach a point, maybe this was just me, but you reach a point in your life and you can't say, well, this is a minister and this guy's of this and this guy's of that. All of us, you come to a point in life. Have you come to the point in life you don't care what people think? Have you come to that point? You need to come to that point. You need to come to that point. Not that you're doing anything wrong, you're, you know, you're hurting people or anything like that. I'm just saying you get to the point where I don't care if anybody laughs at me. I don't care what people think. You know, I, I was called to help a woman that was dying of cancer out at St. Clement. Not St. Clement, but at uh, Cyrene. And uh, never, didn't know them, didn't know anybody in that family. They, there was a trailer there, and they said, uh, will you come out? My mother's dying of cancer. The hospice nurse is here. They don't expect her to make it through the night. And she asked if she could speak to a pastor, and somebody gave us your name, you know, and so on. So I, I went there, and it was at nighttime. I went out to Cyrene. I finally found the house. And uh, prayed for the woman. She was in such pain, she would move all over the bed trying to find a place that didn't hurt. And so on. And uh, led her to the Lord. Whether that was out of pain, whether it was real, that wasn't for me to decide. It was for God to decide. But I told her the truth. Prayed with her to accept Christ. And the, the people that called me, the daughters and their friends, were all in the kitchen playing card game at the table. Not one of them introduced themselves to me. Not one of them said, thank you for coming. Not one of them said, we'll go back there with you. I went back there by myself and with the nurse. And by the time I came out of there, I was mad. I was mad at how those people were conducting themselves. And there would have been a time I would have just said goodbye and left. And I just had enough of it. So I walked up to the table and says, any of you need to stop going to hell? There was a day I never would have said that. But they didn't care. This was something they were just trying to get out of the way. The woman can die. And I'm not sure exactly how I phrased it, but I wasn't trying to be polite. I mean, I wasn't ignorant, but I wasn't exactly polite. I just said, how many of you here are going to hell? My time is it's valuable, and I'm here now. There was a time I wouldn't have said that. But, you know, if I had said to them, I'm going to pray for you, I'm, not, I'm sure there wasn't a one of them that would have said no. You know, we've got to get to the point. You don't care. You're doing the work of God. And especially if God extends our time a little bit. I agree with what Jonathan Kahn said about Trump. He may be wrong. Time will tell in a couple days. But he said again, Trump is not, a, Trump is not the answer. Trump is a door. He's a window. He's a window of opportunity. That should we go on four more years, we have four more years to pray. And I don't think we've done a very good job of praying up till now. But all of us need to realize, everybody should see what has happened to our, our nation. Everybody has to see what has happened to our morals. And it's not just the nation. This is, this is the way the whole world is going. And if God gives us four years where we can still not be afraid to preach the gospel in the sense that they're going to lock us up or something else, did you see the ignorant film clip of the governor of Michigan putting fritos on the mouth of a woman sitting on a bed to mock the, the Catholic communi uh, communion? Did you see that? It was all over the news, all over the papers. It was, it was one of those TikTok things. And all you see is her taking a Dorito and she puts out her hand and then they move the camera. And there's a woman sitting on the bed taking it on her lips like you would the uh, body of Christ. People don't care anymore. The Bible says if the foundations are broken up, what will the righteous do? And I'm telling you, 
Don't, don't be so self-conscious. Be God-conscious. Be conscious of the fact that the person you're talking to, unless they accept Christ, are going to go to hell, and they're going to go to hell as a forgiven person. All, all sin has been forgiven. It's not the issue. Well, I don't want to talk to them about their sins. You don't have to talk to them about their sins. Talk to them about Jesus. Tell them that Jesus took their sins for them. That they are right now, without saying a single prayer, they are forgiven because all sin was taken by Christ. If you don't believe that, you don't believe Romans, and you don't know your theology, but I know you better. Amen. Amen. We've got, we may be given a window. Oh, we're going to preach no matter what. Even if, you know, Harris wins. We're still going to preach the gospel, but it would be much easier if the government wasn't against us and would be for us. But either way, either way, you and I have no excuse to stand on. All we have to say to somebody when they, because I'll tell you what, how many people come up to you and say, oh, let me tell you the day I've had. Or is it more like, oh, man, you should know the day I had. Bless God. You know, they don't know who God is, but that's what they'll say. And you can say, hey, mind if I say a prayer for you? Just remember that. Because God wants us to strengthen the weak hands and the feeble knees. And that's what we're called to do. We're going to stop there. <laughs> I'm never getting these done anymore. Let me pray for you. Pray for all of us. Father, thank you for this time that you've given us today to study your word. Lord, thank you that Jonathan encouraged David in you. He strengthened his hand in you. Lord, that's what you want us to do. That's what you want us to be. People of encouragement, people who give strength. Lord, we give the, we get, we're told in your word to comfort others with the same comfort you've given us. We should bless others with the same blessing you've given us. We should love others with the same love that you have given us. Lord, when we are talking to people, when we say, can I pray for you? It is not you alone praying, but by God, they will be prayed for as the Holy Spirit speaks within you. Do we think we go into these situations that make us nervous? That God has not already prepared somebody, that's not prepared their heart, has not prepared you to say the right words. You might not even be aware of it, but when you speak, God will speak through you because he wants those people encouraged and saved more than we could hope or think. So, Lord, I pray that you'll use us mightily, make the divine appointments of this week, bring us into the lives of people in our families, people in the grocery store. It doesn't matter. Sometimes you can just see people are hurting or people are just in a bad mood or whatever. And just to say, can I pray for you? And if it doesn't work to pray publicly, ask them if they'll take you out or go out on a parking lot or do something or go into another room or something. But pray for them and pray for them and pray for them. These are the things for which God will hold us accountable. Not for our sins, they are forgiven. But let us speak to people, Lord, who don't know their sins are already forgiven and think there's something that Jesus has to do for them. But it's really not so, Lord. All you expect us to do is believe that he came, that he died, that he rose, and that he lives for us. And Lord, that, that their sins are already forgiven. Amazing the people in hell whose sins have been forgiven on the cross, but simply won't accept the one who did the dying. Lord, use us. Give us a boldness in these last days and hours. Use us for your glory and the increase of your family. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good week, beloved.